Hey guys, Victoria Faxton here. Thanks for stopping back by my YouTube channel. Okay, so today we're going to talk about Judy K. Lowry Munguia. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. I'm probably butchering it because I do that a lot on here. So I apologize. No disrespect if I... But then again, her husband's a schmuck, so I really don't care because that's his last name, right? Okay. All right. So... First of all, like, share, subscribe, it's free, all that good stuff. Okay, I have to give credit where credit is due. Okay, you ready? Here we go. Let's go, Jeeves! Heck yeah, man! That was the most amazing game, the last two minutes of that game. And you know what? Kudos to the, to the Buffalo Bills. They, Buffalo kicked ass too. Um, but I was so glad my boys pulled it out. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The shirt, my sister actually had it made for me when they won the Super Bowl two years ago. Hopefully, they're going to return to the Super Bowl this year and they're going to kick some serious butt. Um, they just have to get through Burroughs this weekend. We can do it. Okay, sorry. Enough about that. You know I got to represent the Chiefs. I love my Chiefs, y'all. Okay. Judy Lowry... So, okay, first of all, let me let me preface this by saying it was hard to find a lot of information on her for my research end of things. So I found what I found. So Judy K. Lowry, she went to Odessa High School in the 60s. She dropped out and got her GED. She and her husband, okay, so she ultimately married her husband, Lupe Munguia. They got married a short time later, and then Lupe was shipped off to Vietnam. While he was gone, Judy gave birth to their son, Michael. Um, she ended up going to work for the Texas Commission for the Blind. Um, however, at the time she went missing, she was at home taking care of her son, Michael. So Judy was close to her sister, her parents. Uh, she was able to visit them several times a week. Okay. So, let me, okay. So when Judy went missing, um, Lupe had no problem being interviewed by reporters and such. But in the early 90s, um, he was contacted in July of 1990 to do an article. And he told them he didn't want to talk about his wife and they should contact his lawyer, Bill Bowden. Okay. So after 10 years of his wife being missing, he said it was just, quote, too sensitive of a subject to talk about. W T. F, 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 Okay. What? I don't give a crap how long she's been missing. A day or 70 years. She was your wife. So, ugh, okay. And then his lawyer went on to say that it was just too upsetting for him. I bet it was. I bet it was, you moron. I bet it was. I hope you watch this video. That would be nice. Because I have a few things I would like to say to you face to face in person. That would be really nice. Okay. Once again, this is my opinion. My opinion. I don't need to get sued. Okay. So, Judy's parents, on the other hand, um, they never stopped searching for her. Because they loved her. Obviously. You know. Lupe, not so much. Um... Her mom, Dimples Lowry, died at 79 years old on October 2nd of 2009. And then her dad, J.J. Lowry, died on December 13th that same year at 87 years old. Her son, Michael, ultimately got married in December of 1987. Sorry, guys. So Judy's family said, you know, she loved her son, Michael, so much. There is no way she would have walked off and left him. No possible way, which I can understand because I could have never done that to my child. Like, yeah. Okay, so Judy was last seen the evening of May 28th, 1981 by her husband, by guess who? Her husband, Lupe. You don't say, really. However, he didn't report her missing until June 6th of 1981. So from May 28th until June 6th, he didn't report her missing. Gee, I wonder why. He's trying to let the, you know. Her grave settle, I guess, wherever he put her body. Okay, so she was last seen leaving her home in Odessa, Texas, in her gray 1977 Lincoln Continental. She lived there with her husband and her son, Michael. I saw, they said her son was 11, 
12, 13. I don't think they knew exactly what his age was at the time. Um, they lived at 5608 McKnight. She supposedly left at 1 a.m. with two small bags of luggage, okay? Um, her vehicle had personalized plates that said Munguia or Munguia, however the hell you say it. Her husband said that his wife told him that she was going to drive to a friend's house in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Okay, if she was going to drive to a friend's house, why would she leave at 1 o'clock in the freaking morning, number one? Number two, why wouldn't she take her son with her? Uh, it doesn't make any sense. According to her husband, she was going to be gone for several days. Judy never made it to her friend's house. Shocker. When Judy's friend was questioned, she said she wasn't expecting Judy. Of course she wasn't. This was all a figment of Lupe's imagination. After she'd been missing for three months, a small story was published in the Odessa American on August 27, 1981, regarding her disappearance. Finally. In the story, Ector County District Attorney Investigator Linda Primera said she suspected foul play. Yep. Judy's car was found November 14th. Six months after she disappeared in the Will Rogers Airport parking lot in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Go figure. According to the information they found during the investigation, the car had been parked there since June 7th, which was, ironically enough, the day after Lupe claimed that she went missing. Or, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's wrong. They found her car the day after Lupe reported her missing, okay? But she'd been missing since May 28th, all right? So, okay. I was able to connect with Judy. Um, I told her who I was and what I wanted to talk about. Uh, she talked about her family. She talked about her son. She said she's grateful that she's been reunited with her parents, and, and uh, she looks forward to the day in the future one day that she'll be reunited with her son um, and his family. So, you know, obviously when she started talking about Michael and, you know, so looking forward to the day she's reunited with him, you know, it made me tear up. But she was also like, on the other hand, I don't want him to die anytime soon, you know? So, um, yeah. Um, so I asked her if she would walk me through what happened to her. She willingly just started talking, so I let her. Um, she said that when Lupe came home from Vietnam, he was a different person. Prior to going to Vietnam, she felt safe with him. He made her laugh. Um, they were so in love. She said when he came back, he was angry. Um, you know, and she said she understood that it was because of what he saw in Vietnam and what he went through. So she said, you know, she just kept thinking after more time went by that he was at home and he was safe and he was comfortable, that it would calm, that his, his mood swings and his anger would calm down. That unfortunately did not happen. Um, she said that he had a lot of angry outbursts with their son, Michael. Um, if Michael was too loud or whether he was playing or laughing or whatever, if he was too loud, he would go off on him. Um, of course, she said, you know, Michael loved his dad and um, he just kind of dealt with his dad's anger and his dad's mood swings, right? Okay, so she said that Lupe being happy, like the spells came few and far between. She said, you know, he was happy when he was working on his cars. She was happy. He was happy when he was working on his cars. He was happy when, you know, anything affiliated with his racing, um, you know, it, that made him happy. But as far as his personal life and being with his wife and his kids, she said she didn't see a lot of happy times from him. Um, you know, she said she kept putting up with it because she loved him, right? And she wanted to make it work, especially for their son, right? So she said at the, at the end, he had become much more angry and he was a lot more aggressive and she he said something and upset her one day so she flippantly said if you don't calm down then I'm gonna take Michael and we're out of here and she said he dead stopped and spun around and she said she had never seen this look from him before she said it was just like uh, vacant 
like it was, she said he was so angry and it, he, his eyes were vacant. That's what she was saying. Um, and she said, as soon as she said it, she was like, wow, I probably, I probably shouldn't have said that. <laughs> So she said a short time later, she said she wasn't sure exactly how many days it was. Um, Lupe came home one day and started saying that he knew she was cheating on him and he was going to take care of the situation. And she said first, excuse me, she said, first of all, I'm not cheating on you. Second of all, what do you mean you're going to take care of the situation? What's that supposed to mean? I'm not cheating on you. And he said, it's exactly what I said it means. I'm going to take care of the situation. And she said, okay, but the only person you could take care of would be me because I'm not cheating. And he was like, exactly, and walked off. So she said that um, she got chills. And she said, you know, the other time when he stared at her and it, his vacant look, she said that was the only other time that she was really concerned. So she said, you know, her mind was going crazy. Like, I'm going to have to sneak out in the middle of the night. I'm going to have to take my son. I'm going to have to do this. I'm going to have to do that. Um, so she said, you know, this was like two days before um, she disappeared. So she said the night everything happened, she said it's kind of patchy. She only remembers like bits and pieces, right? And she told me that she doesn't know exactly what happened to her. And I said, you know, a lot of spirits tell me that. A lot of people that have passed tell me that. Like, is there a reason? And she said, yeah, I don't want to think about it. I don't want to remember. It was such a horrible time. That's not anything that I want to have in my head. And I was like, okay. Like, I appreciated her being honest and answering because I've always wondered that. You know what I mean? Anyway, so she said he, he came out of the bedroom like stomping. She said he was, like, intentionally, like, stomping. And he had his hand behind his back, pulled it out. There was a gun. And he grabbed her by the hair and by the neck. So the gun was in, in his hand, but he grabbed her and drug her into the bathroom. And he was, like, um, tightening his grip on her is what she said. And she said he threw her into the bathtub. And that's it. That's all she remembers. Um, she said, you know, a short time later, she realized, wait a minute, I'm not, I'm not in the bathtub. I'm not at home. Where's my son? You know, and she realized, wow, I'm gone. I asked her if she was able to see where she was buried. She said no. She couldn't see any of that. So, you know, she said that she forgives him and that she hopes that he finds peace before it's too late. Um, she's a good person because I don't think that I could forgive him from taking me away from my son. Um, and she said, she said one thing that was interesting. She said that whenever she goes around her son, she knows that he feels her there. Yeah. She said she's aware that he feels her like he knows she's there, which is pretty cool. Um, all right, guys, this was a tough one. They always are. Um, be nice, be kind, stay safe, stay healthy. Omnicron, y'all, knock on wood. Hubby and I haven't gotten it. Um, a lot of people in our family are sick. <laughs> so, okay, guys, um, that about does it for me. Bye, guys.